Chapter 17 Inner Healing He had been on the ventilator for three days, his arms and legs bound in leather restraints, the drip-drip of IV fluids keeping cadence with the hiss and sigh of the breathing machine. Awareness of his body drifted through his drugged brain, which registered distant noises that made no sense. I'm alive. Mission aboard. Mission aboard. Get me out of here. He thrashed and pulled, trying to break the binds on his limbs. Hit him with another dose of morphine, came a male voice. It was the medical intern making rounds. The nurse followed the order, and before Brad swooned back into the darkness, he heard the voice say, A halcyon overdose. Everyone knows that you can't kill yourself with halcyon. What an idiot. He should have used barbs. His brain fired and formed words. Try to get your barbs from a pharmacist, punk. It was the plastic bag that was supposed to kill me anyway. The words strained to get out of his throat, but as he screamed against the tube in his trachea, eyes wild with rage, straining to catch sight of the punk in the white coat so he could hunt him down later, all his caregivers could hear was grunting. Then the morphine crossed the blood-brain barrier and it lifted all the hurtful and destructive feelings. He was whisked away on another pink cloud of opiate euphoria. Jesus, nurse, did you see that? I'm glad he is tied down, said the intern. Yes, doctor. She couldn't stand this arrogant kid who'd reminded her at least twice that he graduated at the top of his class at Stanford. She bent over Brad Rosedale and gently placed the cool, damp cloth across his forehead. His eyelids drifted shut as he returned to the comfort of oblivion. After discharge from the hospital, loaded on sedatives and antidepressants, accompanied by a medic and an armed guard, Brad was wheeled to another building and parked in a waiting area for intake. The wheelchair needs to go back. Can you move him to the bench? Asked the receptionist. Here, let me help you, partner, said a man in a crackly, familiar voice. Brad felt strong hands on him, and two men stood up and transferred him to a wooden bench. The wheelchair squeaked away, and the voice said, I got you, son. It was Mo." Brad struggled to shake off the drugs. Slowly, his dad came into focus, gaunt and pale, appearing older than his years. All the hard living had caught up with him. Hi, Dad. His voice was raspy from the endotracheal tube. Son, I just got out of the hospital myself. They got me diagnosed with lung cancer. I wouldn't have missed being here with you for anything in the world. He left against medical advice to be here, said Glenn, his voice flat and bitter. I had to drive him or he was going to stand on the street and hitchhike. Brad looked up and tried to focus on his younger brother, who was Moe's first biological son. Glenn loomed his six-foot-four-inch frame over them menacingly. He had no empathy for anyone who could throw away a medical school diploma and wind up a basket case in the hospital and a nightmare for his family. Wobbly on the hard bench, Brad started to fall sideways. Mo caught him and put a bony arm around his shoulders. The father's touch pierced his heart and he started to cry. The man who many years ago would have called him a sissy and whipped his ass for shedding tears was now the father who loved him. Mo started crying too. They were both broken. Brad from his zealous drive for success to help others. Mo from his addictions and self-destructive attempts to help himself. Please shut up, said Glenn. The cute little boy had become an angry, balding man with a portly gut. You two are making me sick, he said, stepping outside to take a hit of a joint. Glenn had just witnessed the most intimate connection ever made between the father and his oldest son, and it repulsed him. Glenn was broken, too. An orderly took Brad to his room in a locked ward where he would spend two weeks. Mo stayed at his side until the orderly pointed to the sign signifying personnel and patients only. Father and son looked at each other awkwardly, knowing more needed to be said. Son, I'll see you soon. Get well. I have some things I need to share with you. Brad stayed numb and mostly slept, constantly monitored by the wary staff and forced to take sedatives. As he regained mental focus, he couldn't shake the image of his father and how they had connected on the wooden bench, connected at the heart for the first time. It was just like Moe to make a promise he couldn't keep. The old man died before Brad was released from the psych ward. Glenn visited a few days before Brad's release. Dad died. I found him curled up on the floor of his trailer. There was a pile of papers on the table and pencil in his hand. I tried to read them. From what I could figure out, he was writing a book about the evils of society and how the man was behind everything and was keeping the world from becoming the paradise it was meant to be. It surprised me. It was pretty heavy shit. I didn't know he had it in him. Brad was stunned. How did he die, bro? The cancer was bad. They think it was a respiratory arrest. His voice was flat. Brad waited for more, but Glenn was done. Moe's death shot an arrow through Brad's heart, but he didn't dare let Glenn see the pain. 
The writing was the thing he wanted to share with me. That night, Brad had a strange dream in which Mo was telling him he had much to live for. Don't you ever give up again, son, he heard his father say, and don't let the man get you and do what he had done to me. Mo had loved that old Credence Clearwater song, too. It was a voice from the grave, and he couldn't help but believe he had been visited. Mo's sudden death and his appearance in the dream had a profound impact on Brad. I wasn't supposed to die. A spark of caring arose and turned into a flame that ignited a new mission to fix his broken self. Time for Brad's release came, and none of the Rosedale family could make it. Hannah was the backup. She drove him to his apartment, parked him on the couch, and left him with orders not to do anything stupid. Get your head together and get back to work, she said. Call me if you need anything. She hesitated at the door. Brad? She had never called him by his first name. He twisted to look at her. Yes? Please get better. For me? You're a good doctor. You've helped a lot of people. The world needs you. Really? He was shocked. True, he had some appreciative patience. He had even received gifts from some, but he couldn't remember hearing those kind words. Don't make me repeat myself. She dabbed at her eyes with a tissue and he could see real tears. Then she left and gently closed the door behind her. Hannah's faith and the dream about Mo pushed him to take care of himself. The medications kept him down on the couch. When he wasn't sleeping, he was watching movies or reruns of Star Trek. An episode came when Spock said to Kirk, Change is the essential process of all existence. I need to change. He felt the thought sink in, felt himself burn to get started. How? He walked over to one of his bookcases. Right next to his copy of Final Exit, as if to prove a point, was the Red Book. He picked it and thumbed through its pages. He hadn't looked at it in years. Propping open the thick Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders on the kitchen counter, he pulled up a stool and began underlining every symptom and trait in the book that he had ever experienced. It was a fearless moral inventory, tedious and painful. In three days, he had gone cover to cover. The anti-anxiety meds helped keep at bay haunting childhood memories that sprung forth from reading the mental aberrations. Then he went back through it and outlined imaginary actions he could take to fix them. In the end, he had 15 pages of handwritten notes that contained impossible fixes. Mission control, we have a problem. He was dependent on Hannah and the disability unemployment checks that covered the rent, barely. He hated being so needy and longed to get back to work. On her next visit, he had a request. I did some research and found a problem. I need to see someone to run it by. Earth to Dr. Rosedale. I am here to take you to your new shrink, the one assigned to you by the hospital. Remember? Hannah snapped. It's right here on the calendar I left you. He hadn't looked at it in days. Damn, my brain is fried. I forgot about it. Can you be ready in five minutes? Her emotions seesawed between feeling sorry for him and feeling sorry that she had ever met him. Yet she had faith that he could pull himself together. Hannah took him to the assigned clinic where he met Dr. Sherman, a wise old shrink who peered across his big oak desk at Brad and then at Hannah. Wizened, with thick spectacles, he had seen every misfortune that could fall on human life and the consequences. After a thorough evaluation backed by 40 years of practice, he had only three words. Go to sleep, said Dr. Sherman. His tone was gentle but firm. Go to sleep? Hannah shot back, stunned. What the hell does that mean? I bring you this poor bastard, doctor, who has been bamboozled and cheated by everybody and their damn mother, and all you can say is go to sleep? Her sharp voice rose like the crack of a whip. Brad shifted forward and looked directly at Sherman, wanting an explanation, too. It means, said Sherman in a calm, even tone of voice, that this young doctor had the good intention of trying to help people, and he was taken advantage of, overworked, and has been sleep-deprived for more than a year. His brain chemistry is a mess, and no medication will fix that. I promise, if he can sleep every day without interruption, his brain will heal, and that will give him the best chance of recovering. And how long will that take? Said Hannah, still wary. She glared at Dr. Sherman as if he were the new enemy. Dr. Rosedale's business checking account had dropped below five figures, and she had been scrambling to submit bills and to collect whatever money she could. She had fired two staff members and kept one girl to run the office, now empty of patients, with the expectation that the doctor would pull himself up by his bootstraps and get back to work any day. It might take a year. Nobody can say exactly. Brad, what are your thoughts? 
Brad's mind was swirling with conflicts triggered by what he had been hearing. He was too tired to complain, so his rational self took over. I studied my problem and made some notes. He waved the stack of papers. If you can look at these and help figure out how to solve all these symptoms and personality traits, I think I'll be good. Sherman took the papers and shuffled through them. His eyes widened. Royd would be proud. You've done a ruthless self-analysis. Impressive. I've been pushing 24-7 as long as I can remember. Fear of failure always made me work to succeed. I failed anyway. I decided to work to succeed at fixing my failure. The session ended and Hannah drove him back to the apartment where he'd lived since the foreclosure on his spacious hillside home. On the way, she stopped at Safeway and they bought groceries. Look, mister, she said. It was going to be a speech. He could feel it coming. She went on about her needs and what she could do for him and what she couldn't. Stop putting your head into a goddamn mental toilet, she finally said. Tough love, they called it. Yeah, thanks. Brad brought in the notes again from the Red Book, and they covered him in three visits. I've got all kinds of problems, he told Sherman. A few obsessive-compulsive characteristics, some avoidant ones, and a number are borderline. None are enough for a full-blown personality disorder, but, but altogether, it's a wonder I made it through all those years of medical training. The emergency room trauma you were attracted to and wanted to fix as a trauma surgeon reflects your inner trauma that needed to be healed. Those personality traits are adaptations that helped you overcome your inner wounding. They became maladaptive. The wise shrink would push him as far as he could handle it, then back off and wait for him to assimilate. All my negative traits are symptoms of a deeper problem. I get that. And you're the one who will fix it, said Brad. No, you're going to fix it. I'm just giving you the tools, said Dr. Sherman. Come on, Doc, give me the whole toolbox right now. He was facing an inner abyss that invited exploration, but at the same time felt like it could annihilate him. How broken am I? You won't know which tool to use first. Let me guide you. Weeks went by, Brad showing up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Sherman applied his best intellect and massive wisdom to reach his patient and fuel his desire to get better. Even the most attentive parents can do damage to a child's sense of self, he said. They tell us, don't feel bad, it's okay. In the absence of good parents, you became your own parent and used success to override your damaged sense of self. You bought your lie that things were okay. You needed to feel bad to learn to process it. But that didn't happen. Brad was hanging on every word. Sherman looked to make sure he was getting it, the signal being confirmatory eye contact. In your case, Brad, he went on, with parents that were inattentive and abusive, there was no chance to learn that difficult emotions are temporary, normal reactions. There was always some new trauma to bring about painful feelings that you couldn't process before the next blow-up. Lights were going on in the deep, dark recesses, Dr. Sherman kept coaching him about his childhood experiences. Adverse events, he had called them. You had one of the worst childhoods of any client in my 40 years of psychiatry. I can't think of many who were worse. One of my patients had a childhood history of being chained to a radiator for days at a time. But he didn't finish high school. Incredibly, you made it through a competitive surgical residency. But it's no wonder you ended up making so many poor choices since then. I'm tired of blaming others. My parents, my colleagues, and my profession, Brad told Sherman. I don't know who to be angry at anymore. I know I can't blame myself, and I can see where that went. You tried to fix the emotions by fixing the outside trauma they caused, starting with a paper route at the age of 10 and winding up as a workaholic trauma surgeon. But you can't fix the inner self that way, no matter how hard and long you work. Dr. Sherman persisted and forced the origin of Brad's crisis out into the open. One of the last things his patient had to let go of was the deeply rooted anger he had projected onto himself and his parents. Your traumas generated emotions that got stuck in your unconscious mind. They will continue to affect your life until you process them. There is nobody to blame, least of all little Bradley who tried to be Superman and couldn't do it. Your parents were stuck as well, dealing with their own wounds in poor ways. It's not all their fault either. That was a tough one. But Brad finally let go of his anger toward Mo and Natalie. He imagined them as abused or neglected children, and it made his heart ache. It sounds kind of textbook to say this, Brad, but the healthy flow of feelings like anger, sadness, shame, and fear is essential to healing your wounded inner child. Some of those feelings, anger or shame, for example, may be worse for you than others. When an adult with unresolved childhood trauma encounters a difficult situation, 
It can be like a knife wound and trigger a counterattack, even violence. It can turn to self-harm. Your workaholism became a form of self-harm. What about constant demands to do more work even though the schedule is full? That's what happened to me. Brad, despite knowing better, still wanted something to blame. Well, you had a very valuable skill and were good at it. It's only natural everybody wanted your help. That's where setting boundaries comes in. They talked about boundaries for the rest of the session, but the words that hit home were emotionally healthy adult, whatever that was. It felt like a label for some new species. He had to become that. It would be his next mission. Dr. Sherman continued to work on his patient's emotions like an alchemist turning lead into gold. Hannah helped him set up meetings and process paperwork until he got clearance from the medical board to return to work, an ordeal that took many months. After several rejections, he found part-time work seeing patients with neck and back pain in a pain management group that was bursting at the seams with referrals. The entrepreneurial group would hire anybody who could walk, talk, and carry a valid medical license. Brad began living a monastic lifestyle. The visits with the psychiatrist were down to twice a month. He was off the medications, and he was finally sleeping well and not getting calls to work on nights and weekends. You don't need me anymore, said Dr. Sherman. We're done, unless you want to come in to socialize like we've been doing for the last two months. Brad swelled with gratitude. I think you're right. I'm back at work with no danger of burning out. I'm going to the gym. I've lost weight, and I'm sleeping eight hours a night. I guess I'll call you if I need you. I won't be here much longer. I'm retiring in two months. I'm going to ride my bicycle from San Francisco to New York City. Really? Wow. Brad suddenly realized he knew nothing about Dr. Sherman, while the shrink knew more about him than anybody on earth. Okay, Doc. Well, happy retirement and be safe. Enjoy your trip, Brad said. He could have hugged the old man, but it wasn't his style. They shook hands and Brad walked out, relieved of the inner demons that had not only plagued him, but almost killed him. He thought of his dad who had died while still suffering from his inner conflicts with himself and the man. Lucky me. As he walked to his car in the clinic parking lot, a haggard man approached. I'm hungry, mister. Do you have any change? The sight of the man wrenched his heart. There, but for the grace of God, goes Brad Rosedale. He pulled out his wallet and gave the man a $5 bill. Man, try to find yourself and don't ever give up. It was a reminder of his mission to help people. He got into his car and watched as the man walked briskly across the parking lot and entered a liquor store. Thanks to Dr. Sherman, gone was the fear of failure that had driven him out of bed every morning to work until he dropped. The need to find and conquer an endless series of challenges. A need that had constantly goaded his mind and body was gone too. It amazed him that he could sit and do nothing and not feel guilty or worthless. He didn't miss the adrenaline rushes and self-important feeling of getting stat trauma calls nights and weekends. Going to work and taking care of people with ordinary problems like backaches and tennis elbow became a pleasant routine. Life was less exciting, but also less demanding. As he settled in, a new feeling surfaced. A deep, nagging feeling that something was still missing. A memory came back, as if to guide him. The memory of the three beings who had appeared in the vision 20 years ago when he was a teenager and said, To become square, square yourself. It was still as mysterious as ever, and the time had come to solve the mystery.